Welcome to the show that entertains and educates. Welcome to the Wolf Stand. My name is Mark Tobri, and today's guest is the co-owner of Fifth Element Wellness that recently won the Fitness Business Independent Business of the Year Award at the recent Fitness Australia Awards. He is known around the traps as the gut guy and people from all over are coming to see him in droves because of the results that he is getting for his clients. Please put your hands together and welcome David O'Brien. Welcome, David. Thanks very much, Mark. How's thanks. it going? Yeah, amazing. The obligatory um, question. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. First. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, amazing to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm getting renowned for being a bit of an expert on the gut. I think actually one of your trainers actually called, called me the Rain Man when it actually came to the gut. And it's actually... That'd be uh, Tyler Cosner who's yes, with us today. Tyler, yeah, um, who I've helped with a bit of gut issues. I might use him as a bit of an example somewhere along the line. Yeah. Um, but it's quite funny actually, because we actually put our survey out when we actually do things like blood chemistry analysis and stool analysis and so forth. And actually someone actually wrote in there asking if I had Asperger's. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's kind of a so, yeah. compliment. Yeah, well, yeah I'll, like, ta well, I'll take it, yeah. I'll take, it. Yeah, I'll yeah, take yeah. it. I don't have Asperger's by the way, <laughs> yeah, okay. So, not to my knowledge, unless, unless people think I've got Asperger's, yeah. But I might display a little bit of tendencies of Asperger's, yeah. So, That's great. So yeah. you started as a trainer when? Um, I've been a trainer, it's, it's a long time actually. Um, um, actually out of university, I actually didn't practice being a trainer straight away out of university. Um, actually, I was doing landscape gardening, believe it or not, okay, which is far away from personal training, but uh, I actually did it to um, get some money so I could actually go traveling. And it was actually when I went to, when I went to London that I actually became, uh, started practicing my trade. Um, and in London, I, I sort of worked there for 10 years and I actually worked in a few uh, boutique facilities uh, in London. And I actually had a pretty amazing clientele, but I sort of got caught in the rat race in London to be honest, yeah, like I sort of, I practiced exactly what I sort of learned at university. Um, and I think there's a lot of limitations in just sort of practicing sort of like one formula of how to train people. And um, I found that it was sort of a little bit of a mixed bag, like the results I was getting with clients, like it was a bit hit and miss. And most of the clients I was working with, I was not really getting the impact that I wanted to. Um, and just a minute amount, I was actually getting some all right results. Do you know what I mean? What year so, was that? Um, so it was two, uh, 2000 that I went to the yeah. UK um, and I stayed there for 10 years. Um, but the problem was, and you know, for any uh, uh, aspiring trainers out there, uh, the problem was that I, I didn't really uh, further my education for quite a long period of time because I was like, I thought it was amazing. Like I was training like, you know, doing 55 sessions in a week. And I thought that was incredible because it was just like churn and burn and so forth. But it wasn't until maybe even like about five years or I think, yeah, maybe about five years later that actually someone told me about Charles Poliquin actually. Uh, it was actually one of my good mates who's actually one of the head guys at UP, Eduardo Baruta. Um, he actually told me about Charles and um, I actually went to, along to one of Charles's like biosignature courses and that was the time because it was five days and he actually went pretty heavy into biochemistry. He didn't really touch a huge amount on, on gut health but it was a lot on detoxification, micronutrients and all that. And over those five days, that was the moment that I realized I knew nothing. So five years of doing PT, Meet Charles Poliquin, the, the pioneer, in my opinion, of, of this industry. Yeah. Changes your direction and course. So I know part of it, because I'm a student, I mean, we're all in the fitness industry, I feel in some way, form and shape, students of Charles, whether it's directly or indirectly and things like this. But if you, you, you did a course with Charles, he put you on a direction. Uh, it seems although, because there are guys who go in, you know, in myself included, different directions, mm. you found the functional medicine side or functional health side of things. How did you find that and when? When did you fall in love with that? Yeah, well, you know, just quickly going back to Charles, it was actually like a conversation that I had with Charles and, you know, rest his soul. Um, he was good enough to give me like 10 minutes of his time where I actually sat down and I said, look, this is some of the thoughts that I've got with the fitness industry, which was based on more of a holistic model and so forth. But he basically said to me, um, all the stuff that I'm teaching you now means nothing unless you actually go away and you research it more than I've researched it. Okay, and it was, it was a conversation that sticks in my head today. I, can't, I, can't, I cannot repay 
the motivation that Charles gave me, okay? And actually, I took that literally, maybe applied a bit of that Asperger's uh, <laughs> demeanor, yeah? And I literally just, when I actually eventually sort of came back to Australia, I literally, on weekends, I would just research. Um, and I'd just go pretty far down the rabbit hole, yeah, okay? And that's actually, in 2010, was when I started to look at blood markers. Um, and I was good, it was, you know, it's great that I learned from people like Dave McDonald, actually, uh, James Laval as well. Um, looked at a lot of stuff for that like Chris Cresser. Um, so, you know, Sarah Godfrey, when it actually came to female hormones and so forth. So I started to go further and further down the rabbit hole when it came to how the body worked and, um, and, and, and so forth, yeah. Um, and it was at that point when I started to look at blood markers and so forth, I started to realize there was a lot more to it than just the, the function and the structure of that particular blood compound and so forth. And actually a lot of the things that I've adopted now, when I look at your blood markers, um, I'm looking at how do you assimilate food? Okay, how do you break down protein? How do you break down things like lipids? How do you break down things like carbohydrates? And actually your blood compounds can be a good indication of bacterial byproducts and so forth that you might actually have in your body, yeah, okay? Because you understand when people look at things like blood markers and that, most of the time they're looking at just the function and, and what, the, what, what that actually particular blood compound does. Does that make sense? And for me, it's the correlations that are the most important, okay? So how does that blood marker correlate with this blood marker and what it actually represents? So I can look at someone's blood markers, which wasn't taught to me. It was actually uh, came about from me comparing blood markers to stool analysis and actually seeing that there was trends in your bloods that were indicative of issues like SIBO, like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, actually having like high antibody response, which was an indica indication of things like intestinal permeability. Uh, and, and so just on that, what, what are some of the blood markers that you see uh, in, indicative of that? Yeah, uh, okay. The practitioners watching. I mean, there's obviously a, a lot of trends that I see in like blood markers and so forth, but if I just use a few, a few indications, um, one would be like uh, the MEBs, which is the monocytes, the eosinophils, and the basophils. Yeah, okay. Uh, and in layman's terms, like the eosinophils and the basophils, bless you. Yeah. Uh, the eosinophils and the basophils, they're like pro inflammatory white blood cells. So they can be actually a sign like there's like high antibody response taking place, which basically means that there's things going into the bloodstream that are causing like a histamine reaction and an antibody response. Uh, and, and your body has to also produce anti-inflammatory mediators and so forth to respond to that antibody response taking place, yeah, okay? And if the MEBs are above like 0 0.7, like they're 0 0.8 or above, that means potentially there could be a lot of histamine reaction, a lot of antibody response taking place, which could be the initial signs of something like intestinal permeability or some sort of structural uh, damage to the epithelium or like the mucosal lining. Yeah, so that that's one indication, but something like SIBO, for instance, um, I'll just probably use a, a couple of examples, but something like SIBO, something like your total bilirubin. Just yeah. before you get into SIBO, just so it's a complete podcast, what is SIBO? SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That's what it basically stands for. Now, if you're gonna ask my opinion, they basically say about 60% of the population have IBS. Not 100% sure where they're pulling that statistic from, yeah, okay? But I think something like IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, okay? For me, I think it's a bit of a, it's, it's, it's a bit of a medical sort of terminology, yeah, okay? Um, because, okay, you've got an irritable bowel, but why do you have an irritable bowel? Okay, it's not actually giving me answers to what's actually going wrong internally in my gastrointestinal tract, yeah, okay? So we could say you're responding quite badly to uh, particular types of foods, then you eliminate those foods, yeah, okay? But does that solve your problem? Okay, it's just food avoidance, yeah, okay? And you understand that most people are going through this food avoidance thing where they're going, oh, I react pretty pretty bad to zucchini or I re react pretty bad to chicken and so forth. So, and then they avoid those foods, yeah, okay? And, the, the, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, but your food sensitivities change every three to four months. People need to know that. It's actually based on food rotation and so forth, yeah, okay? Uh, and something like, uh, really what IBS is for me is really SIBO, okay? And so we could say that maybe up to 60% of the population have something like SIBO. Basically, you've got bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, okay? Because most of your microbiome should be located in 
basically which area of your gastrointestinal tract. Most of it should be located in your large intestine. You've got about 400 different species in the large intestine, yeah, okay? And it's not that you don't have species in the small intestine, but most of the time the, the species that we see in the small intestine are things like lactobacillus mainly, okay? And, and also small amounts of like bifidobacterium and so forth. But most of your, your microbiome should be in the, in the large intestine. You've got things like helicobacter, uh, in the in the stomach and then you've got about 40 different species in the in, in the mouth but basically what's happened with people with SIBO okay is a lot of people like a lot of the literature you're going to read people are going to say oh, it's caused by heavy metal toxicity or hydrochloric acid issues because basically if you've got hydrochloric acid issues you're not a, you're not breaking down the food efficiently which means it sort of gets passed down into the small intestine where basically the small intestine goes what's what the hell's going on here yeah okay because now the small intestine's got to work a lot harder to break down the the, the macronutrients, which means it sits there and ferments for longer periods of time, which is going to encourage bacterial uh, issues. But more for me, something like SIBO is actually caused by like epithelium damage. And so what I mean by that is more likely mucosal lining damage. Okay, so and there's all these different types of damage that you can actually cause to the to the to the microvilli and the the sub submucosa and actually the villi itself. Yeah, and okay, I might get into this a little bit later. Is, and that can cause a whole array of different symptoms, yeah, okay? Now, if I'm struggling, if I've got issues with the brush borders and the, and the microvilli, and I'm struggling to, to break down the, the macro molecules and the micronutrients and all that type of stuff, well, that's gonna affect transit time, does that make sense? Which means a lot of these, uh, these food particles and that, they're gonna sit there and they're gonna ferment for longer periods of time, okay? So if they're sitting there and they're not getting uh, uh, broken down properly, then that's going to encourage bacteria to travel from the colon up the cecal valve into the small intestine where they're essentially going to do what? They're going to sit there and they're going to feed on the, the, the food that is fermenting. Does that make sense? And most of the time, we don't really know what the full breakdown of the microbiome is when it comes to SIBO, but it does tend to be E. coli. Okay, it tends to be E. coli, Clostridia, which is Clostridium, okay, and uh, Bacteroids. Yeah, okay, so they tend to be the, the major bacteria. What are Bacteroids. Yeah, they're just a, another form of uh, um, microbiome. Yeah, okay, and uh, I want I want you to understand is sometimes it can actually be an overgrowth of bacteria that you do actually require. Does that make sense? So yes, it can be bacteria that is pathogenic in nature. Okay, and most of the time with SIBO, it tends to be bacteria that is pathogenic in nature. But it can just be an overgrowth sometimes of good bacteria as well, because I don't want to I don't want to de demonize a lot of the microbiome. Okay, because even the even the bad stuff to a certain extent, because it's a little bit like happy families in there. Okay, so you should have a bit of a balance between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria, yeah, okay? And most of the time our issues are ratio issues when it comes to the microbiome, yeah, okay? So does that sort of make sense with, with, yeah. with, with SIBO? So you've actually got an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine, and this is where obviously the fermentation rate of certain foods becomes problematic, yeah, okay? Because if you look at things like carbohydrates, okay, so one quart, which basically means one particle, of, uh, of carbohydrates equals 10 quarts of hydrogen ions, okay? So you're producing excess amounts of hydrogen ions in that scenario because that stuff is, the carbohydrates is sitting there and it's fermenting for longer, which encourages more hydrogen ions and actually um, two excess amounts of hydrogen ions in the small intestine can actually um, cause issues with what we call TRPV1 receptors, which actually in layman's terms causes vasorelaxation. Okay, and that's why a lot of people, when they've got something like SIBO, they get things like diarrhea and so forth, yeah, okay? Um, and then, because you've got the excess amounts of hydrogen ions yeah, in the system, you've got a particular bacteria called Arche, and the role of Arche is to break down the excess amounts of hydrogen ions, okay? But what is the byproduct of Arche? Methane, okay? So now, all of a sudden, you've got excess amounts of methane in the system as well, and that's why people will belch and fluctuants, and they will get that generally after higher amounts of carbohydrates because they're sitting there and they're fermenting for longer. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And so people naturally might go, and that's why low FODMAP has really come into the, into the fore because low FODMAP is based on foods that don't sit there and ferment for long periods of time. Does that make sense? And a lot of people go, well, I just feel amazing on a low FODMAP diet and I'm gonna stay on a low FODMAP diet for the rest of my life, yeah, okay? And that's one of the worst things you can do because 
Actually, high FODMAP foods are exceptionally good for you. Now, why? Because they provide food for the microbiome and so forth. And they've got their own nutritional benefits. And actually, a lot of those high, high FODMAP foods, especially things like garlic and onion and so forth, they've got properties like inulin that are actually f essentially food for the, for the epithelium. They're actually food for the mucosal cell. Does that make sense? They actually help with the structure of the mucosal cell and help so, with things like secretory IGA. So question about the FODMAP diet, right? Mm. Say I'm on low FODMAP, I've cut out all these foods, we're calming down the, the reaction uh, in the gut. When, when can we start adding in the carbohydrates? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question because it just depends on obviously what the issues are that are actually going on in the gastrointestinal tract because those issues can be quite diverse and it's gonna, diff, it's gonna differ from person to person, yeah? So for instance, if obviously in this, like we're talking about SIBO, yeah, okay? Because SIBO would be a justification for going on something like a low FODMAP um, regime. But just people need to understand that if you've got something like SIBO, it's very, very likely also that you've got mucosal lining damage. And that's actually why you've got the SIBO in the first place. Okay, now, is there a lot of research to back up that fact? Not necessarily, okay? So, so this uh, is Dave special. It is a little bit, yeah, okay? Because I, I think what you're gonna find is that more and more research is actually gonna point that if you've got mucosal lining damage and, and potentially things like intestinal permeability, and I, I don't like to say intestinal permeability or leaky gut all the time, because I'm just basically saying that people have got damage to the gut lining, okay? And that, the, the type of damage that you can have to the gut lining is quite diverse. Does that make sense? Why so would can, they have damage to the gut lining? Yeah, because it can be numerous factors that would contribute to that, yeah, okay? because it's a good question, yeah? Because everyone, when they sit in my office, they go, what caused this? And they want to know the one thing that essentially causes- Gluten! Yeah. We'll get to that <laughs> in a minute, yeah? gluten for yeah. everything, it works. Yeah, and well, you know, <laughs> for a long time, people would just blame gluten or the, like gliden, okay? Because essentially it stimulates a particular tight junction protein, which is called zonulin, okay? And even if you look at the research, because this was, came about from a research paper from a guy called S. Drago, okay, in 2005. The guy from Rocky, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't. If he lives, he lives. If he dies, he dies. That's, quick, that's pretty impressive that yeah. he's smart as well, yeah, okay? <laughs> but basically, this research paper, which, um, you know, sort of, I actually backed a lot of the things that I used to say on this research paper as well. I don't necessarily think that he was trying to claim that that gliden or gluten was a necessary really bad thing. He was just talking about the reaction that ha happened in the gastrointestinal tract. And he actually proved that the gliden molecule stimulated zonulin and basically, cause that's the, the gatekeeper to the tight junctions, yeah, okay? And basically what would happen is that would tell zonulin to open the junctions a little bit wider, okay? Which means you've got hyper permeability through the tight junctions, which means certain enzymes and protein molecules would be getting through those tight junctions into the, you know, the hepatic portal system, so bloodstream liver, and causing like an antibody response. If you've got an antibody response, there's gonna be cell reactivation, so you're gonna stimulate white blood cells, and then guess what? Then your mm -hmm. body's gonna produce anti-inflammatory mediators mm -hmm. like prostaglandins and all these things. Okay, you can tax those things because they're essentially dependent on things like omega-3s and all this type of stuff. And that's why you can tax your stores of omega-3s if you've got a lot of antibody response and a lot of inflammation taking place. Does that make sense? So he wasn't necessarily, I think, trying to say that this is really bad. He was just saying that this reaction takes place whether you're celiac or non-celiac, okay? Now in a healthy gut environment, okay, things like calcium, so minerals would actually go up the tight junctions, yeah, okay? And then actually would tell zonulin because uh, it's like the zipper, so calcium's like the zipper, where it tells zonulin to pull the junction tight again, yeah, okay? But when I'm in an unhealthy gut where I've actually got damage to the submucosa, yeah, okay? And actually like the, the epithelium and the mucosal cell, well then the problem is you can have like uh, issues with mycelizing factor, which means you struggle with fats and oils, which means a lot of the calcium can get stuck in the fat deposits, the things that are not getting broken down properly, which means the calcium isn't really going up the tight junction, which means it's not telling zonulin to, to tighten that junction again, okay? Um, so in, in an unhealthy gut environment where someone has worn down that, the, the gut lining, then gliden becomes a problematic thing. But, because more for me, it's an exacerbator. Does that make sense? I don't think it's the devil, far from it. But I, back in the day, I just used to say to people, 
like gliding's the devil, yeah, okay? And that's basically what's causing your intestinal permeability. And the likelihood is it's, it's not really. So okay. what is? Well, most of the time it's things like chronic stress because if you just look at the stress response, yeah, okay? Now we need to understand if when I'm having a stress response, yeah, okay? Uh, that initial stress response starts in your hypothalamus and you produce a thing called corticotropin releasing hormone and corticotropin releasing hormone in high amounts tells your digestive system because it down regulates ghrelin okay and ghrelin is your hunger hormone yeah okay so all of a sudden because you don't want to be trying to digest food in that stress state does that make sense yeah okay and then that because it's just need to understand about uh, digestion and breaking down food don't get me wrong because obviously I'm talking about it yeah okay it's important but is it imperative okay in moment and time is it imperative yeah okay and I would argue in moment and time there's three functions that are imperative for the body to deal with because it just comes down to survival okay and the whole thing is stress response in moment and time okay is imperative because if I don't respond to whatever that's so if it was a guy coming charging at me with a knife and say I'm sitting here eating like my sardine salad because I'd probably eat sardines yeah okay canned sardines or yeah canned sardines are right I'm not going to go into the, the you know the, the what whatever the the can's been made out of and the heavy metal oh, toxicity on, but <laughs> but generally sardines are a little bit of like a cleaner you're fish fresh, okay? fresh sardines or you're getting well, fresh sardines would be better yeah for, for sure yeah okay but I'm sitting here eating my sardine salad yeah okay this guy comes charging at me with a knife now what's even more important me digesting the sardine salad or me dealing with the guy with the knife yeah okay now I've got to deal with that stress stress response and you can understand people have got this stress response going on constantly throughout the day and your body does not understand the difference between maybe this instance of the guy coming charging at you with a knife yeah okay and your, your boss hassling you yeah okay or you've got problems emotional stress at home does that make sense like it's still a stress response in the body yeah okay which means you're going to have this reaction yeah okay um so that's the the body needs to respond to that because the body perceives what could the end result be death okay and the other one if i'm having a stress response are you going to elevate blood glucose levels yes because you've got to have energy to deal with this situation does that make sense okay so blood sugar would be another imperative func function in moment and time okay because if you don't stabilize your blood sugar levels or you don't elevate your blood glucose to deal with that situation yeah okay and you don't stabilize your blood sugar levels potentially you could slip into a coma okay and you could die okay so once again the body's going to prioritize that situation and the third one which i think is a little bit of the overlooked one is antibody response okay yeah okay and that's actually to, to do with bacteria yeah okay because if i don't deal with bacteria okay what could the end result be well that bacteria can start to attack my cells yeah okay and if it's attacking my cells what could the end result be it could be disease illness and so eventually how is the body dealing with bacteria and in terms of like what's it throwing at it to deal with yeah, it yeah correct yeah well it's gonna it's going to produce like anti-inflammatory mediators yeah okay like even your 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 good microbiome they actually produce antibodies that help you fight bacteria that's attacking your cells so there's many mechanisms that they use to enable you to to fight bacteria that's potentially attacking your cells and so forth but also micronutrients, yeah, okay, because like your white blood cells and so forth. And what we're going to understand with white blood cells, I always say this to people, yeah, okay, um, that you don't have like an oompa loompa factory in your body, okay? So there's not like guys spinning away at their wheels and, and like producing more, like an infinite supply of white blood cells, yeah, okay? Because you look at things like uh, white blood cells, they come from stem cells within your bone marrow, okay? But what's one of the key building blocks for stem cells? Vitamin A. Okay, what do I actually need? It comes down to micronutrients for me, yeah, okay? And if we look at vitamin A, that's it's why- It's like I'm unlocking the waterfall. Yes, the TLC. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically, <laughs> yeah, vitamin, yeah, vitamin A is one of the key micronutrients that we actually need for the stem cells. And then if I actually look at other micronutrients that they need, something like vitamin C, vitamin C actually helps with your ability to synthesize white blood cells, okay? You look at vitamin D, now vitamin D for me, it's sort of like the backup, yeah, okay? Because when you convert vitamin D into its more bioavailable form, yeah, or more bio bioactive form, which is 125D, that actually allows you to produce antimicrobial peptides that actually fight bacteria. That's why vitamin D is essential for clearing bacteria and so forth. But imagine my vitamin D stores are really low, okay? Then that puts a lot of pressure 
on my white blood cells now. Does that make sense? So, in other words, just to recap on that, you've got vitamin A, vitamin C as the kind of forefront front line in this. this and there's other micronutrients and, as well. And then, then you have vitamin D, which you're referring to as the backup. So it's, it's when you see low vitamin D, that's highly concerning. Yeah, because that can actually be a sign that the, the body's having to produce a lot of antimicrobial peptides to potentially fight bacteria, yeah, that, you know, overgrowth of bacteria in the gut lining or in the body. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And also, like, you look at things like neutrophils, yeah, okay, and neutrophils are really interesting in blood markers because they do tend to be extremely low most of the time, yeah, okay, which is a sign of immunosuppression. And neutrophils, are like, they make up about 50% of your white blood cell supply, and they're real their real role, okay, because um, they're part of your innate immune system, which means like initial responders. But when I say initial responders, they take about six hours to get to point of infection, yeah, okay. But uh, neutrophils are the heavy hitters against things like negative gram bacteria, yeah, yeast, mold, mold spores, candida, all these types of things. You just opened things. up so many topics. I do want to get back to one thing that we, we went before. We've kind of danced around a little bit. Why, why is it damaged? And I have heard something around the gut that the gut lining can repair itself every five days. Yep. So why, you know, say I go on a FODMAPS diet for five days, why isn't my gut re rebuilt, number one? Why, why can't just removing the offending foods start the process of rebuilding? But why is the, the, the wall, the epithelial wall damaged in the first place? Because more for me, it comes down to the allostatic load on the gut for most people is, is huge. And what I mean by that, remember I said there's not generally one factor that is causing like this de deterioration. It tends to be a multitude of different factors. Yeah, okay? So, so it can be stress? Yeah, it can be things like emotional stress. Yeah, okay? So we can actually know that people, um, and it's actually proven, proven through uh, medical research, that when people have more things like emotions like fear and anger and sadness and so forth, that we know that these emotions start to wear down the mucosal lining. Now, in particular, they will actually affect your secretory IgA levels. Okay, and if we actually look at a secretory IgA, which is an immunoglobulin, which, which means it's a protein molecule, okay, which is really, really abundant in mucus. Okay, and so we've obviously got mucus well, when it comes to things like snot and tears and saliva, but actually one of the highest amounts of mucus in the body is in the gastrointestinal tract, yeah, okay? And secretory IgA, I like to um, use the analogy of it being a little bit like a venous fly trap, okay? So it's actually produced within the, the epithelium, with actually within the mucosal cell, okay? And that rises more to the surface, like the, the apical part of the cell or the brush borders, yeah, okay? And there it's sort of is like a venous fly trap. It's like a sticky substance and it traps in pathogens and microorganisms and so forth. But we actually know that when you've got a lot of emotional stress and it's actually some of the smartest brains that I think going around like Bruce Lipton and Greg Braden, they've actually done research to show that your emotional state will actually wear down the secretory IgA levels. Now, when I do things like uh, stool analysis and so forth, because the highest concentration of, your, of secretory IgA yeah, is, is, is in the gut lining, well, it's gonna tend to come out more in things like your stool, okay? And so sometimes if you're producing a lot of it because you're going through a high emotional state and so forth, then there can be a high amount of secretory IgA in your stool, okay? So it is quite a sensitive marker, so you gotta take it with a pinch of salt, but then over time, what do you think is gonna happen to your secretory IgA levels? Okay, if you're not fixing things like the emotional, the, 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 the emotional state that you're in and so forth, then your secretory IG, IgA levels over time, they're gonna drop down. Okay, a lot of people, when I look at their stool tests, one of the most common scenarios I see is that the secretory IgA levels are extremely low. Okay, and when the secretory IgA levels, and I don't just use one marker, I just need people to understand, I'm not just basing that people have intestinal permeability and, 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 and damage to the mucosal lining based on one marker, because I'll correlate it with other markers within the stool that can actually be a representation of something like intestinal permeability as well, yeah, okay? So, well, it's just a great time just to say, this is not health advice, health disclaimer, this is not health advice. Do seek medical advice. Uh, this is only for entertainment purposes only. This is not, do not take what Dave's saying and then apply it to yourself and go, all oh, right, you know, I had that thing that you said and I just went on the FODMAPS diet and yeah, so don't be that guy, don't be that girl. This is not health advice, entertainment purposes only. Anyway, continue. 100%, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, so 
in, in that instance, yeah, okay, like, um, yeah, someone's negative emotions and so forth, that can be one factor that actually starts to- What, what are other factors? So you, you've outlined stress is a big thing, right? And emotional, it's, it's, so it, let's say, cause I'm just trying to go through my head because, well, firstly, let's start with a premise. Is it, is it true that you can heal, like the gut rebuilds every five days? Or you have a new gut lining every five, in a healthy person? That was sort of yeah. one of the axiom, axioms in the uh, Poliquin days. Yeah, look, the, the whole thing is like, most of the time people's gut lining is so deteriorated because once again, there can be, you can actually get damaged to so many different areas within that, with, within the gut lining. I so you, you might get deterioration of, of the actual villi, okay? So you can have deterioration of the microvilli, you can actually cause damage to the submucosa. You can actually cause damage to the villi. Yeah, okay. So we're talking about like the, yep. the bigger structure within the small intestine. And actually, when you start to get damage to the actual villi itself, yeah, okay, which they call crypt uh, hyperplasia, yeah, okay, that's actually those people start to get problems with amino acids. Right. Yeah, okay. And when they start that's... to get problems with things like amino acids, well, what do you think that's going to start to affect? Recovery. Things like but also neurotransmitter balance, yeah. okay? Because we've got to understand like, you know, um, particular byproducts like neurotransmitters and hormones, yeah, okay? Schizophrenia could start. Well, they're essentially derivatives from food. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. But if I'm not actually breaking down the singular amino acids properly because I've actually got issues within the villi and so <laughs> forth, that's going to affect things like my neurotransmitter balance. And it's also going to affect things like my hormonal balance because you look at neurotransmitters, they're essentially like, biogenic, which means basically the precursor is an amino acid, okay? So L-tryptophan gets converted into serotonin, yeah, okay? And you've obviously got things like phenylalanine gets converted to tyrosine, into L-dopa, and then into L uh, dopamine, yeah, okay? But if I'm not able to assimilate these amino acids properly, that's going to affect my neuro neurotransmitter balance. So if I've got like villi atrophy, yeah, okay, all of a sudden you start to get like neurotransmitter and hormonal issues. Does that make sense? It does. So if I, I'm trying to paint out this, this picture in my head where to stack the deck, say someone comes in and they need, I need to recover my gut in the fastest time per possible. They go on the FODMAPS diet because it does come back to the question of when can people introduce, reintroduce these foods from the FODMAPS diet. So they're on the FODMAPS diet. Let's say they go to a club med for let's say a week. They're on holiday. There's no stress. They're all that good. Is that warrant? What, what else affects the recovery or, or the time in which they can bring back those carbohydrates? Yeah, once again, it does depend on the, in, the individual. I know I'm not necessarily giving a, like a straight answer on this because if, if certain cells within the gastrointestinal tract are in a good state, then that actually allows you to heal particular epithelium, so other mucosal cells, because people need to understand there's many different uh, mucosal cells in, in the gastrointestinal tract, okay? So it's not a case that there's just one type of mucosal cell that you're damaging. You're generally damaging all these different types of mucosal cells, which I can go into a little bit more, but some of those cells, they actually help to heal the other mucosal cells. And one of them is called um, progenitor cells, okay? Uh, and so progenitor cells, if we've actually got the, the once again, the villi, they actually sit more towards the base of what we call the intestinal crypt, yeah, okay? And the role of the progenitor cells is that they're actually to do with neural stem cells, okay? So these are the ones that actually are related to the enteric nervous system, which is the communication between your gut and your brain, okay? So we've got a nervous system that exists between our gut and our brain. So, and I actually think a lot of time we've damaged that communication between the gut and the brain. And these progenitor cells- How have we damaged that? Yeah, well, once, it, once again, it's just that, it's, it's a combination of uh, how we're handling emotional stress. Okay, so that's one factor. Yeah, so is okay. the forefront of, of recovery for you a lot of the time emotional health? Yes, because even like when I probably talk about some of the things you can do to start to repair the gut lining and so forth. So I'm going to be honest, it's quite easy for me to make inroads into repairing the gut lining. Okay, I think if someone's caused severe damage over a long period of time, it may take you about two to two and a half years to fully repair that. Okay, and now that flies in the face of what they're saying with, where we could potentially repair it within five days or so forth. Because sometimes the damage is so extensive in the mucosal lining, it's gonna take a while, yeah, to actually make bigger inroads into it, yeah, okay? Um, and I've seen that in so many different people and actually I saw it in myself, okay? I had such bad intestinal permeability, like literally, I was urinating out my backside about six times a day. 
I started to have like serious neuro neurological problems. Okay? It's like you've read my notes because that was the next place <laughs> I wanted to go. Exactly that, eh? Tell me about the time where you urinated out the time of your backside, eh? <laughs> it's like, it's like you saw my notes on that? It, what? It, it goes back to the waterfall, doesn't it? <laughs> it yeah, does, okay. so, TLC, yeah. Uh, don't be chasing those scrubs. Uh, yeah, no. and so like, it, like the reason I went so far down this sort of rabbit hole with the gastrointestinal tract because I lived that nightmare. When, when was that for you? Um, so basically, it really probably came about, it's pushing my brain a little bit, but probably when I came back from London, strangely enough, yeah, okay? Because obviously when I was in London, look, I, I, I pushed the envelope, I partied pretty hard, yeah, okay? I, I drank a lot. Yes, of course, I, on the outside, I might've looked fantastic, yeah, okay? Like I had a six pack and, you know, I trained pretty hard and, but I was pushing the envelope. Like I would, I would train maybe 10 to 12 people on a day. Yeah, I was doing up to 55, 60 hours plus in a week. And then on the weekends, I'd go out and I'd party really hard. Okay. Um, and yes, I actually was eating pretty clean back then. Yeah. Okay. But I pushed my body to the brink. Okay. And then that was coming in a detrimental harm down the line to my gut. Yeah. Okay. Um, and actually how it manifested for me initially was like energy system issues. So I started to get really lethargic, really tired. Okay. And actually it wasn't until quite further down the line that I actually started to get a lot of gastrointestinal problems. Yeah. Okay. And before that, my brain started to break down on me. Yeah, okay. So I actually went from an extremely social, social person to actually having extreme like social phobias. Yeah. So I couldn't stand being in a, a social setting. Okay. And that was the complete opposite of actually what I was like. Yeah, okay. And actually I had a, even like uh, like photophobia. Okay. So this is like circa around 2010, 2011. Yeah, 2010, 2011, probably 2012 as well. Yeah, okay. Um, and I even like was scared of getting my photo taken. And believe it or not, uh, having like photophobia and actually uh, scare of things like uh, flashing lights and getting your photo taken is actually linked to a particular strain of bacteria. It's actually linked to alpha hemolytic streptococcus. Yeah, okay. Now. <laughs> It's strange enough, like when I actually did stool testing further down the line, what do you actually think I had? Exactly I actually, bacteria. Yeah, I actually had a, an overgrowth. Now, in, in very, very small amounts, that bacteria is not pathogenic in nature. It can actually cause things like uh, strep throat, yeah, okay? And even things like sepsis and toxic shock syndrome and infection in the red blood cells and so forth. But so do, do it is linked to neurological problems like phobias and so forth. Do we get sick? because of the emotional component or is, are we getting sick because of the physical component? Which one in your opinion, like mind, body, body and mind, which one is the chicken or the egg? I think the best way to explain where I'm coming from, yeah, okay, is that I, because I'm putting a lot of emphasis on the gut, correct? Yeah, okay, but I actually don't think it's where a lot of people's problems start. Okay, I actually think most people's problems start in the brain. Okay, so it's actually emotional stress, yeah, okay. It might be things like social conditioning, yeah, okay. It might be their belief systems, yeah, okay, their insecurities. So a lot of these things, these negative emotions and so forth, but you understand then there's other stress loads, okay. So exposure to things like chemicals and heavy metals, yeah, okay. So then we're putting into our body things like food additives and colorings, yeah, okay. So they start to exacerbate it. Then when, you, when you're dealing with something like gliden or gluten, yeah, okay, the concentration of gliden is a problematic thing because now it's a higher concentration, which means now it's also making uh, more hyperpermeability in the tight junctions. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's exacerbating it, yeah, okay? And then it can be our water because our water essentially, I know like water, you know, is pretty, pretty much involved in every single biological function in the body. And the structure of that water is really, really important. It contains things like, unfortunately, things like chlorine. And guess what it doesn't have? It doesn't have a lot of the minerals and the micro minerals that it should contain, yeah, okay? Like things like magnesium and, you know, chloride tends to be all right, but its sodium concentration is not as good, yeah, okay? So we're, we're, we're drinking the, the water structure has chemicals and they, in, in small amounts start to deteriorate the gut lining and so forth. Does that make sense? And what people need to understand is if I'm starting to have a lot of these antibody responses and so forth, well, guess what? Your own immune system can start to deteriorate your gut lining, yeah, okay? Um, because even like if I start having high neutrophil activity because I've got the antibody response, well, neutrophils are all to do with H2 receptors, yeah, okay, which is histamine receptors, okay? So they actually start to cause aggravation in the gut and then guess what now you start to get bacterial issues 
and the byproducts of bacteria, so things like LPS, like lipopolysaccharides, yeah, okay, and acetaldehyde, which you get. Let's from, go back to that. What are lipopolysaccharides? So lipopolysaccharides are like fatty acid molecules and long chain carbohydrate molecules, like monosaccharides and polysaccharides, okay. And LPS is basically it makes up the outer membrane of negative gram bacteria. Okay. Now I need people to understand is that negative gram bacteria is not the devil. Okay. I'm going to draw some pictures. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So negative gram bacteria. I just want to really emphasise this is not the de the devil. Okay. Because we've got pathogenic strains of negative gram bacteria, but we've also we've also got non-pathogenic gram uh, strains of negative gram bacteria. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But when you've got an overgrowth of the pathogenic strains of negative gram bacteria, what can actually happen? Because once again, it's, it's a ratio issue, okay? Which means when this, the, the, the bacteria, which is an endotoxin, when it's actually getting broken down, what it will actually do is, is expel, which I'm gonna draw in a minute, mm. it's gonna expel more LPS into your system. And the LPS can actually cause more damage to the epithelium and the mucosal lining, yeah, okay? Now, the, the important thing to understand as well, okay, when there's more LPS in like things like your bloodstream and so forth, yeah, okay, then you need things like glutathione, which is the master antioxidant, yeah, okay, that's actually required to clear a lot of these byproducts and so forth out of the system. So essentially, like excessive amounts of LPS, they actually, it actually catabolizes L, um, uh, glutathione. So your glutathione pools tend to be on the on the lower side, okay, and glutathione is synthesized in the liver, yeah, okay, but then glutathione deals with some of the most stubborn xenobiotics, yeah, okay, so it deals with things like heavy metals and plastics. Now, if I play devil's advocate here, okay, because my glutathione pools are depleted because I've got excess amounts of LPS, which is coming from the negative gram bacteria, now, I'm going to be exposed to heavy metals, whether we like it or not. Like, I don't want it to be doom or, doom or gloom, but we are going to be exposed to heavy metals in a modern society. And it's we're not reality. talking about ACDC either. <laughs> no, far from it, yeah. Um, yeah, so we are going to be exposed to these things, yeah. Now, um, if I'm accumulating like more heavy metals, I need the glutathione, yeah, okay? And I need the sulfation pathway, which is another liver detoxification pathway, which tends to be down, okay, when you've got things like SIBO and intestinal permeability. So the, the, the problem is, is that because I don't have the glutathione pools, then the heavy metals start to accumulate. Okay, so all of a sudden I've got more heavy metals in the bloodstream and guess what? More heavy metals in the bloodstream, things like mercury and so forth, they can start to lodge in certain areas of the body and especially areas like the brain and they'll affect things like the nigra and the nigra is where I produce more dopamine. Yeah, okay. And so it starts to cause a negative effect on uh, a dopamine but it's also can affect things like acetylcholine. Yeah, okay. And if I've got issues, with, I'm just playing, I'm just letting people understand the cascade effect in the body. And if it's impacting things like acetylcholine, okay, and acetylcholine is the gateway to the vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve helps with communication of the brain to the heart, yeah, okay, but it's also part of the enteric nervous system. It's all interconnected. Enteric nervous system is to do with the gut and the, and the brain, yeah, okay. Then the, the vagus nerve is the key to the parasympathetic nervous system. So what is that going to affect? That's actually going to affect rest and digest. Does that make sense? Okay, so you can get someone who's got gastrointestinal issues. Let, let's say two people, put them in an environment where they're exposed to toxins and heavy metals. One person's got gastrointestinal issues and the other person doesn't. I'm telling you the person who's got gastrointestinal issues, they're the one that's gonna have problems with heavy metal toxicity and so forth because they don't have the, the compounds to be able to clear the excess amounts of heavy metals out of the system. Now we just generally say, oh, that's, that guy's unlucky, okay? I'm just saying it's probably down to the fact that that person had gastrointestinal issues. Does that make sense? Okay, and, and for me, once we actually start to fix the structure of the gut and we actually start to so, realign the, the natural microbiome. But why with, does that guy have gastrointestinal issues? Is that simply because what in your experience that guy stresses more than the others or thinks more, has a more emotional an, It's load? just an exacerbation of many, many different factors. If you actually listen to people that they would say contribute to things like intestinal permeability, permeability, you can have up to 18 trigger factors for something like intestinal permeability. And they generally say if you have five or more of those trigger factors, and a lot of the things are things that I'm talking about, okay? So it's, it's, so the, it's the, stress, by, toxins. the byproducts of bacteria.
Yeah, okay, things like nitric oxide. People need to understand there's different forms of nitric oxide. Yeah, okay. You've got inducible nitric oxide, is, which is what your body produces when you've got bacterial issues, but that can cause issues and deterioration of the mucosal lining and the gut lining. Yeah, okay. The LPS that I was talking about, the acetaldehyde, which is a byproduct from things like parasites and yeast and candida, they can also contribute to deteriorating this gut lining even more because the acetaldehyde essentially what it does is actually shrinks the epithelium so it actually makes it essentially smaller which means you're losing surface area in your gut does that make sense okay so those are factors but also your own immune system like producing more things like basophils having too high uh, histamine activity because remember i said when we have this stress response yeah okay we also because histamine is going to also be released, yeah, when we have a stress response, yeah, okay? Um, and so if we're releasing more histamine, I don't want people to think of histamine as the devil, yeah, okay? Because histamine as a neurotransmitter actually helps with sleep-wake cycle, it actually helps with um, regulation of things like libido and so forth, and as a hormone, it actually helps to make our gut more permeable. Now, a lot of people are gonna go, that's bad. But it does that for a reason, so it can transport things like platelets and red blood cells and white blood cells around, around the body so that we can respond to the antibody response. Does that make sense? But what happens all of a sudden if, if I'm producing too high amounts of histamine? Does that make sense? And one of the byproducts of something like SIBO is excess amounts of histamine. So now I'm making my gut even more permeable. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So even histamine can contribute to that load on the gastrointestinal tract and once again you know we just talk about the emotional stress we talk about the pollutants and the chemicals and so for me there's i can't give people the one thing that is actually causing a lot of the gastrointestinal stress because you know what for me it's a multitude of these things so it, it's the exacerbation of all these things that is actually making the deterioration in the gut lining more significant than ever before. So what you're saying, Dave, is if I drink kombucha every day, everything will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> but what about gut right? I take a gut right supplement and everything will be fine as well. Yeah, and that's why if you if you flick through the comments, yeah, okay, you're going to get a lot of people who are saying, I don't feel too good on this, yeah, okay? Because if you look at a gut right supplement, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to sort of bad mouth supplements and so forth, but just when it comes to the gut, you need to you need to understand more evidence. Okay, putting these things in, you could, so one person's medicine is another person's poison. So what's your stance on kombucha? Well, because I know there's people watching it going, let me just, let me just fix this with kombucha. Let me go yeah, to Ping Tang Island on Club <laughs> Med and just take some kombucha and, uh, you know. And that's the thing, look, look in, a, in a healthy gut environment, having a little bit of kombucha now and then, it's fine. What's now and then? Twice a week? Look, having it maybe like once a week. And I, I like a rotation when it comes to a lot of things like that help with microbiome, um, like prebiotics and so forth. So even things like pectin, okay, which is a skin on fruits. But that doesn't mean you should be sitting there eating a truckload of like nectarines and peaches and apples, yeah, okay? Because you only need small amounts of these things to actually help with the microbiome. Does that make sense? Even when it comes to resistant starch, yeah, okay? And you've got all these different types of resistant starch, yeah, okay? But if I've got microbiome imbalances, yeah, okay, you understand that these types of things, then they're, they're not partial to what they feed, okay? So if I've got a ratio issue, yeah, okay, it's just gonna feed what is, whatever's down there. And I'm, if I'm drinking things like kombucha, I'm having high amounts of resistant starch, okay? These things don't go down into your digestive system and go, Hey, guess what, guys? I'm only here to feed the good stuff. Right. Okay. It's just going to feed what it, whatever's in there. Does that make sense? And if it's feeding essentially what it, whatever's in there, okay, the problem is that's going to cause an inflammatory response because unlike if it's feeding the good bacteria, okay, which means then those, that good bacteria is producing amazing byproducts like short chain fatty acids, and that would be things like butyrate and propionate and acetate, and then these things help with reducing inflammation and producing T regulatory cells that help your body recognize your own immune system. So all these amazing things, when it's essentially, when you've got like a ratio issue where maybe it's more like 50-50, okay, then it's feeding the bad bacteria, then they're not producing these byproducts. Does that make sense? And guess what? They're releasing more of these uh, uh, negative byproducts that I was talking about, like things like LPS 
an acetaldehyde, and then that's causing more inflammation in the body, yeah, okay? And most of the time what I'm trying to do is reduce the inflammatory load in the body because if I'm causing more inflammatory response, and, I, and once again, it's the, 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 the inflammatory load is the issue because inflammation is not necessarily a negative thing, okay? But if I'm causing high inflammatory load in the body, we'll understand inflammation bluntens the brush borders. So it actually causes damage to the brush borders. Now, if I've damaged the brush borders and the epithelium, because they, they, they sit at the top of the mucosal cell, okay, and their job is to digest particular nutrients and things like dietary fats and so forth, but also it's to release enzymes that help you break down particular uh, macromolecules and so forth. So they're gonna produce things like lactose that allows you to break down things like lactose. They're, they're gonna produce things like maltose that allow you to break things down like maltose. They're gonna produce things like sucrase that you see where I'm going with this, yeah, okay? And, and, and glycoamylase and all these, all these enzymes that allow you to break down these, these macronutrients. Does that make sense? But if I've damaged those brush borders, do you think potentially that might affect how I'm breaking down these, these glucose molecules and so forth? Like 100%, yeah, okay? And what's gonna happen to a lot of these glucose molecules and so forth? They're gonna sit there and they're gonna ferment for longer periods of time and essentially what could that encourage? Once again, that could encourage bacterial overgrowth because there's a high amount of fermentation. And a lot of people, when they say to me, they'll go, I've got lactose intolerance and, and, and even things like fructose malabsor malabsorption and fructose maldigestion. I go, do you really? Do you really though, yeah, okay? Because, or is it, is it a fact that you've actually got damage to the epithelium, you've actually got damage to the gastrointestinal tract, which means you can't produce these enzymes allowing you to break down these particular molecules. And I think it's more of a sign that they've actually got damage to the epithelium and the mucosal lining. Okay, even when it comes to things like uh, like fructose, because you know a lot of people have problems with fructose maldigestion and fructose malabsorption. And guess what? In the past, like I've really demonised fructose. Yeah, okay, but understand, fructose is fine. Yeah, okay, fructose is not bad for you. It's actually in in smaller amounts is good for you. Okay, what do you define as smaller amounts? Well, once again, it can depend on the person. They say if someone's got something like insulin resistance, they might only be able to tolerate something like 25 milligrams of fructose a day. But once again, like, you know what? Uh, obviously, because of the fiber content in fruit, like actually fruit is, is really good for the gut lining. That's the irony, yeah, okay? But if, if the person's got damage to the apical part of the cell, which is the, which is the brush borders, okay? So it's the top section of the mucosal lining. I don't, know, like, I don't know if our listeners, maybe they haven't heard of things like the glute proteins, okay? But the glute proteins are transporters, okay? And so you've got all these different types of, uh, they're made up of like 500 amino acids and their job is to transport glucose compounds and sub substrates as well. So things like urate, like uric acid, okay? And things like myonositol and so forth. But you've got one particular glute protein called the glute 5 protein. And when that's released from the cell, it actually goes into the apical part of the epithelium, actually the, the mucosal cell. And its job in a nutshell really is to actually help with the metabolization of dietary fructose. Now, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, yeah, okay? But if I've actually damaged that mucosal lining, could that potentially affect something like the GLUT5 protein where I can't actually metabolize the dietary fructose? properly and I'm, I'm i'm not saying that fructose is the issue here and some people i have to uh, take things like fruit away for a short period of time does that make sense because if i'm not metabolizing it properly and so forth what what type of response is it causing in the gut it's causing an inflammatory response okay so and if it's causing an inflammatory response that's putting more pressure on my internal environment does that make sense so it sounds like a lot hinges on the health of the epithelium and so i suppose it comes back to answer the question what can we do today to keep that healthy keep that singing keep that you know as as good as you can possibly get it because once that damaged it sounds like you're in for a bad time yeah i mean and that's why like if you know and i'll, I'll only try and touch on this briefly okay but if i talk about like all those different epitheliums and all those different mucosal cells yeah okay i'll just run through some of the major functions of what these these 
different types of epithelium do, but the, uh, there's the major one that actually makes up the highest proportion that line your gastrointestinal tract. So like your, your stomach and your small intestine, your large intestine is in the enterocytes, yeah, okay? And the enterocytes, actually, what most people don't realize is that 25% of detoxification takes place in the gut. So detoxification starts in the gut and guess where it finishes? Finishes in the gut, okay? So we've been putting all this pressure on the, on the liver and saying, well, we need to really uh, help with liver detoxification. I'm just going, don't worry about the liver. The liver is probably the most robust mm. organ in the body, yeah, okay? So we're throwing all these liver detoxification tablets and I'm just going, most of the time it's the issue upstream, yeah, okay? Um, and in, it can actually be damaged to the enterocytes, okay? Because the enterocytes actually allow you to produce enzymes to allow you to break down macronutrients, yeah, okay? And also, they're all to do with antigen response, yeah, okay? So how we're reacting to particular food antigens, and guess what? They trigger like T cells. So basically, they tell your, your, your T cells, which are substrates of like your lymphocytes, so they're basically immune response, okay? And that's just the enterocytes. Then you've got things like enteroendocrine cells, and guess what? These produce hormones, okay? So a lot of people don't realize that within these mucosal cells that th these hormones are only produced there, okay? And so we're producing things like glucagon-like peptide one, okay? And glucagon-like peptide one, which is produced in the small intestine, the large intestine. Oh, I promise I only use this one example for the hormone, yeah, okay? But its role is to control the emptying of the stomach into the small intestine. Okay, so if I've got damage to the epithelium, could that potentially affect the production of this particular gut hormone? Okay, which means the emptying of the stomach to the small intestine is quicker. Okay, and also glucagon like peptide one helps with the release of insulin. Okay, which basically means that the person cannot regulate their blood glucose levels. Okay, and so if I've got low levels of glucagon like peptide one, okay, because my blood glucose levels are raising really high, okay, and then they're gonna drop really quick, Okay, so people who've got low levels of this particular hormone, they snack frequently. Okay, they just can't stop snacking, yeah, okay? And I know people that I've dealt with, okay, say stick to particular meals and they're just snacking in between meals all the time. And my argument, my argument could be is that they've actually got damage to the epithelium, okay, which is actually affecting particular hormone production and so forth, yeah, okay? You've got gastric inhibitory peptides. So there's all these particular modelin, Okay, and guess what? Modelin actually helps with gut motility, so it actually helps with how you're churning uh, in the gastrointestinal tract. Yeah, okay, um, and modelin you actually produce more when you're fasting. Okay, so there's all these different hormones that we're actually producing within there. Yeah, okay, and then you've got goblet cells. Yeah, okay, and these goblet cells they produce like a mucus. Okay, and they help to trap in pathogens and microorganisms, so they protect us. You've got PANF cells, which I already mentioned, because they produce. Uh, particular enzymes like lysozymes, okay, another thing called secretory phospholipase, and they actually help us get rid of bacteria and so forth, yeah, okay, and then we've got the progenitor cells, and they help with communication to the brain, but all this also they help with the replenishment of the other epithelium. Now, when we damage the, the epithelium, what I need people to understand is there a good chance we might damage all these cells, yeah, and if we damage, like, so once we actually start to damage the top of the villi, we start to damage the intestinal crypt, which is the, and then those epithelium at the base. And so that affects how we combat pathogens and microorganisms. And that's why all of a sudden people are more prone to things like candida and yeast and parasites. Yeah, okay. So because it's, it's a full deterioration of that epithelium, does that make sense? And so my argument has been, yeah, okay, is that there's no way you're just going in there and just damaging one type of cell. You're damaging, and so the, the symptoms, could they be quite diverse, the different symptoms that you could get? Yeah, okay, so you could actually get neurological problems. Okay, so you've got neurotransmitter issues. You've got hormonal issues, yeah, okay? Uh, and, and we know even things like your microbiome play a key role, because I think first time I caught up with you, Mark, I said, for me, terrain is everything. I mean, we spoke about Louis Pasteur versus Deschamps and the whole back back in the 1930s, I think it was that whole uh, thing of the the paradigms and that people the one that got popular was Louis Pasteur, the bacteria uh, yeah. theory. Is what well, that's the reason why we have disease. Yeah, and um, what I'm saying is, I, I like to use this uh, 
I don't know if anyone's seen a movie with Kevin Costner. It's called Field of Dreams. Yeah, and there's a particular, maybe not, it's an it's, it's a older movie. I'm getting a little bit old now, yeah, okay? But there's a particular quote, it's a baseball movie, yeah, okay? And he actually builds this, this, uh, this baseball field to basically, uh, so his dad can come and play, his dad's passed away. But I'm not gonna get too much into the movie, yeah, okay? But basically he says this quote in it, he says, if you build it, he will come. And the one thing I really wanna get across to people, if you build it, they will come. And so what I mean by that is your microbiome, okay? Because if I'm not really fixing the structure, okay, that's not really going to encourage good diversity in, in the gastrointestinal tract. And I suppose okay? just, just real quick, the way you fix, the starting point of fixing the structure is starting off with something like a FODMAPS diet, getting rid of the, the bad yeah. guys. All, all we wanna do, because everyone thinks like, they get me wrong, they think I'm anti-fruit, yeah, okay? Or I'm really pro ketogenic diet, high fat diet. To, to be honest, like I'm not, okay? There's a lot of negative things that can happen if you stay on a ketogenic diet for a long period of time, okay? Because I'm not, and I'm not talking about like 85% fats here, yeah, okay? Because if that's to get into ketosis, okay? And I want people to understand the quickest way to get in ketosis is fast. But guess what? You've got to be in a pretty good state to be able to fast correctly, okay? And actually understand, I already said that there's huge benefits to the epithelium from fasting because you produce particular gut hormones like monolin, which actually help with gut motility. So they help with it. With that, with that churning, and that, and they help with the churning of food and so forth. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, like, like, like for me, like the ketogenic diet. Okay, going eighty five percent fats, doing that for too long, you actually stimulate particular hormones. There's one called acylation stimulating protein, and if I'm stimulating that, that can also stimulate insulin, which means the person actually starts to put on a lot of body mm. fat. Yeah, okay. So for me, I'm talking more about 55, 60% fat. If we actually do have some, some damage within the epithelium and we've actually got- And generally uh, speaking, how long is someone gonna have to follow that for? Once again, that's why I sort of uh, put more of an urgency on acting on fixing the epithelium, epithelium as, as quickly as you can. Sometimes that time frame could be up to three months to four months, which in the scheme of things, I don't actually think is a long time. Yeah, okay. Because really the key is we just want to reduce the inflammatory load. We want to reduce the inflammatory load so we have a better opportunity of what? Healing the gut lining. Because if, I, if I'm dealing with, with a lot of inflammation and so forth, it's going to make it harder for me to heal that epithelium. And half the, half the time that's the problem with people because they've got so much inflammation taking place, it's making it harder for them to to, to heal the epithelium. And the one thing is during that time period, I get the person to really work on mitigating the stress response in the body, okay? So I get them to do things like meditation. I get them to do things like heart math, okay? Heart math is actually controlling their uh, emotions at night, okay? Because most, most of the time people are going to bed in what sort of state? In a stress state, mm. okay? If they're going to bed in a stress state, okay? Mm. Is there a good chance that during their sleep and so forth, they're actually causing even further damage to the epithelium, yeah, okay? So people should really, for me, when they go to bed, yeah, okay, is that's where they should actually practice things like gratitude, care, compassion, appreciation. So they're actually changing their state and guess what they're actually helping with, okay? It's proven that those emotional states actually help to increase secretory IgA production, hmm. yeah, okay? So I actually, do a lot of work on getting people to put stress management things in place, okay? So that when they finish something like a gut protocol, they're not gonna start to deteriorate that gut lining again. Does that sort of make sense? That's great. Thanks, yeah. Dave. this has been great. We're gonna have a quick break and be back with the one word game. See you on the other side of this one. Hey folks, welcome to the show that punches you in the face with information, but in a good way. You are watching and listening to The Wolf Stand on iTunes and on YouTube. So if you are watching this on YouTube, please do me a favor and hit subscribe and give it a thumbs up. If you're listening to this on iTunes, we'd be forever grateful if you could leave us a review and make sure you follow the show. This is episode 12 with David O'Brien and the last or past 11 episodes have been equally as fantastic and we've interviewed the heavy hitters in the fitness industry to give you the very best content available 
in podcast land and YouTube long format interviews today. So we're gonna get into this interview. Before we do, I do wanna give a huge shout out to our clients at Enterprise Fitness, our team, our amazing team at Enterprise Fitness. This past Good Friday, we raised over $6,000 for the Good Friday Appeal and the Royal Children's Hospital. So massive thank you to everyone who came and was a part of it. And uh, yeah, huge. From the bottom of our hearts, we wanna say thank you. Now, for all the personal trainers out there, do check out this episode that obviously is brought to you by www.personaltrainermentoring.com, which is your hookup for all things personal training so you can be earning like a superstar and making sure your clients are getting the fantastic results that they they deserve. So without further ado, let's get into the David O'Brien episode, which is entitled The Gut Show. Welcome back to this episode of The Wolf Stand. We're with David O'Brien covering all things gut health from dysbiosis to kombucha. So Dave, let's get back into the flow. We're talking about negative gram bacteria. Firstly, what is it? Yeah, negative gram bacteria just refers to the, the cell structure of the bacteria. So just so people understand, we've got positive gram bacteria, which means it has one cell membrane, okay? And that cell membrane is made of peptidoglycan. And the peptidoglycan is like amino acids and sugars. Okay, so if you want to understand what um, what would be examples of like positive gram bacteria, for instance, like lactobacillus is positive gram bacteria. Okay, bifidobacterium is positive gram bacteria. And what we need to understand is with positive gram, you can have non-pathogenic strains, which means they help us with all these different functions and so forth. The, the interesting thing is even things with like lactobacillus. Lactobacillus is a carrier for estrogen, so it actually helps to recirculate estrogen through, through the body, which means it actually uh, plays a role in helping to clear excess amounts of estrogen out of the body and so forth. So, um, so they can be uh, non-pathogenic in nature or they can be pathogenic in nature, which means they can be linked to particular ailments and um, um, things like, uh, you know, uh, sore throat, sepsis, infections, and so forth, yeah, okay? And then we've got negative gram bacteria, okay? And so negative gram, which I'm gonna draw now, okay? Uh, its cell structure is a lot more robust, yeah, okay? And the way I want you to look at it with bacteria, most of the time, bacteria is just taking advantage of a situation, okay? So if we had like a, a street full of houses, yeah, okay? And then everyone vacated, that uh, the, the house is in that street, generally what would happen, okay? Squatters. Squatters are gonna come in, yeah, okay? And so most of the time bacteria is opportunistic, which means it's just taking advantage of a particular terrain or a particular environment. Does that make sense, okay? And that's why I put so much emphasis on that particular terrain. And we tend to find like overgrowth of negative gram bacteria is really, really common in people when they're highly stressed, there's a lot of emotional stress and so forth taking place because most of the time we've started to deteriorate that epithelium and so forth, yeah, okay? But its cell structure, okay, which I've drawn for you before, okay, but its cell structure is, this is the uh, cell, okay? So I'm just talking about one bacterial cell here, okay? So the, the, the key to understand with bacteria, what is the key driver of the bacteria? Bacteria wants to survive, okay? That's all it wants to do, okay? And it's highly adaptable, so it adapts to its environment just like we can, okay? It adapts to its environment uh, very easily, yeah, okay? And so basically this cell structure, that outer membrane, okay? This is what the LPS is, okay? So it doesn't essentially, the outer membrane is not made of that uh, peptidoglycan, it's made of the LPS, which is the lipopolysaccharides, which is the fatty acid molecules and the long chain carbohydrate molecules. So get a different color, okay? But basically then you've got a, another, like a layer, and that layer is like a periplasm, okay? And what that periplasm is, like, is like a gel-like substance, okay? So you know how you've got like things like tendon sheaths, okay? And the role of that tendon sheath is to protect the tendon, okay? It's sort of like another protective membrane, okay? And then, Within that, you've got another membrane, okay? And this is essentially, that's the peptidoglycan. So it's the outer membrane of what you get of the positive gram bacteria, but it's more internal, okay? And once again, that peptidoglycan is amino acids and sugars, okay? So it looks like that. And then guess what? It's got another periplasm, okay? So it's got another gel-like protective sheath, okay? And then in the middle, 
it's got its cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm is where it forms more LPS, okay? Because this is an endotoxin, so when it gets broken down, and sometimes when there's trauma and stress in the body, that can break down the outer membrane, and that gets released into your bloodstream. Now, if I've got things like permeability and, and, and structure issues within the gut, well, guess what? This LPS is gonna get into the bloodstream, okay, which is the fatty acid molecules and the long chain carbohydrate molecules, and could that potentially cause disruption, because it's monosaccharides and polysaccharides, could that cause disruption to things like blood sugar and so forth? 100%, that's why negative gram bacteria has been linked to having really, really elevated things like fasting insulin, and maybe the fasting glucose isn't a problematic thing, but the fasting insulin is through the roof because it's actually a sign like the LPS has potentially damaged things like pancreatic B cells, which is affecting like the release of insulin uh, into the body, yeah, okay? So we tend to find, when I look at blood markers, I can see that potentially people got negative gram bacteria issues because their fasting insulin has actually been disrupted. It's just one indicator. Just wanna clarify that. I use many more indicators than that, yeah, okay? And in that cytoplasm, when that bacteria, when the outer membrane gets broken down, then the bacteria forms more and I just need people to understand this is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, once again, if, if you've got an overgrowth, then too much LPS is getting released into the system, okay? But when that endotoxin gets broken down, it forms more LPS in the cytoplasm, helping it form another membrane, okay? But what I need people to understand when it comes to negative gram bacteria, it's adapted, okay? It's adapted to its environment and us bombarding it with things like antibiotics and so forth. Well, guess what? Now it has another protective membrane, okay? And that's essentially what we call a biofilm. And we're finding that more and more things like yeast and candida and uh, strains of negative gram bacteria, more and more of them have this biofilm, okay? And this biofilm is like a sticky mucilage, like protective lining, okay? And that biofilm contains things like mercury, so things like heavy metals, okay? But it also contains iron. Yeah, okay, and the whole thing is like, I can look at someone's like blood markers, okay, and when they've got things like excessively low iron, okay, that can actually be a sign that the negative gram bacteria is uh, sort of robbing them from iron to use it for the protective membrane, okay, and so what happens is someone might see that you've got low hemoglobin, low iron, and they give you iron, we need to understand that iron is highly toxic in the body, and potentially if they've got microbiome imbalances and gastrointestinal issues, by you giving them iron, you could be actually making the negative gram bacteria even worse, okay? And so we need to understand is when we start to break down, and let's say we start to um, uh, do like an antimicrobial phase where we start to break down this negative gram bacteria, okay, and use like a biofilm agent, and the biofilm agent breaks down that, that, that biofilm, Things like mercury and things like iron, they get released into your, into your bloodstream, okay? You must have the capacity to be able to clear those byproducts out of the system, okay? Because now, it's sort of like poking the bear. Does that make sense, okay? Because now there's more iron and mercury going into your bloodstream, okay? And once again, you, you need to, that's why you need the protection of things like glutathione, okay? Because glutathione makes sure that we're clearing a lot of these byproducts and so forth out of the system, okay? And I tend to find more and more people are having serious issues with things like negative gram, okay? And the LPS catabolizes the glutathione, once again, in turn, potentially causing issues with things like heavy metal accumulation and so forth, okay? And things like LPS, okay? And there's all these different strains of negative gram bacteria, okay? I'll give you a couple of examples. Citrobacter, okay? And in particular, Citrobacter fundi complex, okay? That has actually been linked to things like brain abscesses. Okay, actually things like inflammation in the brain and actually a lot of negative gram bacteria, and I'm talking about the pathogenic strains here, okay, they have been linked to a lot of autoimmune conditions. Okay, so uh, especially like Citrobacter fundi complex has actually been linked to MS. Okay, Klebsiella, okay, and there's all these different strains of Klebsiella under that, yeah, okay. Well, Klebsiella has been linked to things like ankylosing spondylitis, rheumatoid arthritis, yeah, okay. And so they've actually been linked to a lot of serious diseases and health ailment, ailments and so forth. And actually, you know, I've dealt with a lot of people with autoimmune conditions and so forth. And actually, uh, one client who I've dealt with with MS, I suspected because the Citrobacter fundi complex has been linked to people with MS. And guess what? When I did stool testing, what do you think came back? 
Okay, she, she actually had overgrowth of Citrobacter, but also Klebsiella. Okay, and then once again, they are actually linked to autoimmune conditions and so forth. And they're also uh, linked to things like pneumonia, meningitis. Yeah, okay, but people need to understand all these things, they're just symptoms. Okay, like even an autoimmune condition, okay, it's a symptom of something more sinister. Does that make sense? And most of the time, it's, it's a symptom of things like overgrowth of negative gram bacteria and depletion of the uh, mucosal lining and the epithelium, okay? And then I would argue that's a symptom of something else, okay? And most of the time, it's probably a symptom of you overloading the HPA axis, like HPA dysfunction. So everyone, you know, remember when like adrenal fatigue was a hot topic? Everyone goes, I've got adrenal fatigue, yeah, okay? And I, I, like, it's not really adrenal fatigue, you've got HPA dysfunction. You've basically overloaded the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenals, okay? And it's actually generally caused by four factors, okay? One is poor circadian rhythms, okay? So I believe when Ben was in here, he put a huge emphasis on regulation of sleep, 100%. That's okay? the Ben Kant episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, super smart guy, yeah. and he put this huge emphasis on regulating your circadian rhythms, okay? So if you wanna minimize that HPA dysfunction, regulate your circadian rhythms in the body. Best way to do that is uh, impact things like DHEA, yeah, GABA, which is gamma amino butyric acid, yeah, okay, and melatonin, okay? And just an interesting side note, 400 times more melatonin is produced in the digestive system than the brain, yeah, wow. okay? All right, so regulate your circadian rhythms. Another one is regulate blood glucose levels, okay? You want to? You want me to be honest? That's one of the easiest things to regulate, yeah, okay? Yeah. It just, just means the person's got to apply it, yeah, okay? Uh, the other one is reduce inflammation reduce inflammatory load. And my big thing here, that's why I put such a huge emphasis on the gut, because if I've got pathogenic strains of negative gram bacteria, if I've got deterioration of the epithelium, is this potentially causing a lot of inflammatory responses and antibody response in the body? 100%, okay? And so by mitigating that inflammatory response in the gut, I peel back one of these key layers that is causing this HPA dysfunction, okay? And the other one is perceived stress. Hardest one to deal with. Okay, why? Because that's people's social conditioning, that's their belief system. And a lot of the time when I'm healing people's gastrointestinal issues, because they're not doing the work when it comes to that perceived stress, okay, what do you think is going to happen again? Mm. They're going to start to deteriorate the epithelium, they're going to start to deteriorate the gut lining, and this time they just get some sort of other bacterial issue. Does that make sense? Okay, and, and so I don't want people to get me wrong. I'm not saying you heal your gut and all your problems are fixed, yeah, okay? But I'm telling you, if you heal the gut lining, you're peeling back one of those big layers. Because if I've got gastrointestinal stress and the bacteria is releasing a lot of these byproducts and so forth, is it potential that that's causing more pressure on the brain? Yeah, because it's overloading the HPA axis. Okay, but if I peel that back, now I've minimized that pressure on the HPA axis, which means now the person is in a far better place to start to do work on what's going on in their brain. Does that make sense? Yeah. Very good. Very good. All right. I think it's now time to move to what we always do on the show, which is the one word game. So the way it works for those who are new to it is let's say, for example, I would say something like uh, superhero and you might say Iron Man for, for example. So it can be one word or it can be a phrase, okay. but we've got to keep it sharp. <laughs> One word, it's, it's, it's obviously people one listening to this podcast, they think it's going to test me, right? Yeah. Uh, all right, ready? Yep. yep. Spirit food. Liver. <laughs> I think you're the only man <laughs> in Australia <laughs> who would say liver. <laughs> how, how do you cook your liver? And uh, just, liver? Did you just slightly pan fry it in butter, so you're getting a lot of that butyrate. Like liver, like... I know I'm gonna, this is longer than a one word. That's right, answer, you said okay? it, yeah, but I went into the whole the, the whole thing with liver, if I had to pick one food that is the most nutritionally dense food known to man is liver. Yeah, yeah right. undisputed, but, but it tastes yeah. disgusting. Yeah, are, have, are we talking like, beef have, liver? Have, uh, chicken liver. Chicken liver? Yeah. Is that your, yeah, your beef, choice? Yeah, beef like calf liver is pretty good as well. I know I'm going to freak people out, but just understand the whole thing with offal and organ meats, it's social conditioning. Like most people, when I say, I need you to eat a little bit of like liver, lamb's brains, they just like screw up their, screw up their nose. And I go, oh, you've, you've tried it before. And they go, no, no. I go, well, how do you know if it, that it tastes bad? 
Okay, so most of the time it's a social conditioning. And the fact of the matter is if Dude, we actually- I've tried it before. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it many times. I've tried eating it. I've got the whole 20 kilo cow's liver in the fridge and just like- uh. But it's a storehouse. So it's got a lot of things like fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, a lot of a, like a omega-3 fatty I, acids. I agree. Okay, cholesterol, I, I agree. iron. Yeah. Just, just need to get a chef to make that taste <laughs> nice. All right, next, comfort food. And if you say liver- <laughs> Potatoes. Oh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> gluten. Depends. Go-to supplement. Magnesium. Supplement you can't live without. Glutathione. A book you recommend. Why Doesn't My Brain Work by Dr. Dardis Karazian. A podcast you listen to. The Wolf's Den. A podcast you listen to. Uh Guy Lauren's podcast, actually. Who, what does he do? He's more about what's going on internally in the brain. So he has people on there like Bruce Lipton, Greg right. Braden, okay? Because obviously, um, I just think that's the area that a lot of people are, it's sort of like the, the icing on top of the cake. So you're talking like neurotransmitters kind of stuff, or you're talking Belief like- Belief systems right. and um, people's social conditioning, um, their emotional health. And because as I said, like I'm just finding, because that's not my specialty, and as I said, I can What's help. someone called? Uh, the Guy Lawrence podcast. The Guy Lawrence podcast. Yeah, okay. uh, recommended movie? Captain Fantastic, actually. Captain Fantastic. Yeah. What's Captain Fantastic? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting a few more questions out of you here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Captain Fantastic is basically based on uh, a family that go off the grid. Yeah. Um, and it sort of, I think it tackles that sort of conundrum of... Um, the good aspects of that and then the bad bas the the bad aspects of that in terms of not having like sh social interaction i just think it's it's a good it's a good indication of having a bit of a blend of that right uh which i which i firmly believe is what we need to go a little bit more towards bit off the grid bit off not off the grid correct half half yeah interesting yeah. uh someone you admire there's many people um I'm gonna go, cause I could go really standard with this uh, answer, but um, my best mate, uh, Paul Arbor, um, unfortunately he passed away before I opened the gym, um, but I admire him every single day. Awesome. Uh, a person who's been a mentor to you? Look, Charles had one of the biggest influences on me. So I'm, I'm gonna have to say Charles, even though I've had many and some amazing mentors, but Charles, yeah, yeah. it's been huge. Uh, something you would like to see more of? I would like to see, I have, this is not a word, one word answer, yeah? yeah. Um, wow. Depends how your brain thinks. Variation. Variation. Uh, less, less of, something you want to see less of? Oh, it's a bit. People thinking that there's one solution to everything. Food everyone should avoid. Uh, stuff that's been genetically modified. Mm. Tampered with, that's what it comes down to. All yeah. food's good until we've tampered with it. Dairy's amazing for you. You know, um, pasteurized dairy, homogenized dairy is terrible for you. Mm, agreed. Yeah. Um, something you're excited about? I love my job. Love it. M most common, just actually before I move on from that one, what is your job? I was asked this question. Can I, can I? Yeah, 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 that's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, someone. Someone asked me a good question on a podcast once and they said, if you were in a plane with someone and they asked you what you did, what would you say? And typical answer would be, you, you say you're a personal trainer, but I would say I'm actually a generalist. That, and I actually, if you want to ask my opinion, how we're actually going to, to really make a big difference in people's lives is I, I think in this industry, we need to be more of a generalist. Very good. Yeah. Uh, the most common health issue you see? Gut issues. <laughs> uh, if you were an exercise, what exercise would you be? Charles is gonna hate this, but I'd say maybe uh, doing squats on a BOSU pad. <laughs> 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 it's a bit of a mix, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a resource all trainers should have books on many different realms. That's and and finally, uh, complete this sentence. It's time for... 
to fix your gut. Nice, very nice. <laughs> Let's give Dave a round of applause. <laughs> All right, we are we are going to go to audience questions, and the first question is from me. I'm going to pretend to be part of the audience, mm-hmm. but I didn't get to get into this topic, and I do want to get into this topic just quickly with you, uh, and that's cold therapy. Mm. So if we can just for the camera, I suppose we've discussed this before, but um, the difference between, you know, you see those crypto chambers or whatever where people are going in super cold versus what you've been doing down at Fifth Element. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, look, I was asked the question once if, if I was to pick one thing that actually has some of the most biggest biochemical sort of benefits in the body, I actually would pick ice therapy, okay? Now, whether that was gonna be the case like 200 years ago, possibly not, okay? But because so many people are immunosuppressed, they've got so many inflammatory responses, I really do think ice therapy is gonna to come to the fore, okay? Because, um, and, and people need to understand, like for me doing things like, uh, you know, um, doing it through air, like actually doing the chambers and so forth, it tends to be people who just don't want to get in the ice water, okay? Now, air conducts completely differently to water, okay? And so the whole thing that we need to understand, like when we're doing something like um, cold, water, cold water ice therapy, okay? Initially what happens is you actually cause like vasoconstriction in the body, okay? So you actually minimize blood flow to the extremities like the arms and the legs and so forth. And a lot of people are gonna go, well, that seems terrible, okay? Because obviously you wanna, um, protect the vital organs, okay? So you wanna protect things like the heart and so forth. So you're gonna keep a lot of that warm blood flow around the, 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 the vital organs, okay? But actually when I get out of the ice, okay, um, you actually, blood rushes to the extremities, okay? And that actually causes high amounts of vasodilation, okay? So you actually cause a thing called flushing, okay? Which means it actually helps with uh, things like transportation of oxygen and nutrients around the body and so forth. Um, so, and also you need to understand if I've got someone who's immunosuppressed, which means like their white blood cells are down, their neutrophils are down, their monocytes and their lymphocytes, there's nothing more powerful for fighting off all this stuff that I was talking about than your own immune system, okay? And guess what? When you get in the ice, okay, it causes a stress response, okay? Which means your body, when you have a stress response, you're gonna stimulate your immune system which means that's why they've actually recorded an increase in things like neutrophils and lymphocytes. And when we're increasing the production of these things, then they're going to actually help to fight off a lot of these microorganisms and so forth. But also on top of that, inflammatory load, okay? So a lot of the, the people's problems are, is that they've got a lot of um, pro-inflammatory activity in the body, which means the body has to produce more anti-inflammatory mediators to combat that, okay? Which takes a lot from the body. Remember I talked about things like prostaglandins and that, which is really taxing things like your omega-3s and so forth, yeah, okay? Now, if I get in the ice, okay, that brings down pro-inflammatory activity, which means your body doesn't need to do what? It doesn't need to produce anti-inflammatory mediators to combat that, yeah, okay? Which means I'm bringing down inflammatory load, okay? If I bring down inflammatory load in the body, you're giving the body the opportunity to do what? To actually healing mechanisms in the body. Okay, and the other thing is, I think it's just completely underrated when it comes to fat burning. Okay, because it's all to do with thermogenesis. Yeah. Okay, and actually, mm. just to understand, like, you know, I'm, I'm big on nutrition and and obviously training and so forth, but it can be quite slow when it actually comes to help, helping with things like fat burning and that. But trust me, when you get in the ice, yeah. Okay your body has no choice. So if you've got things like leptin resistance and insulin resistance, okay, the body in that instance is not gonna go, well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna generate heat, yeah, okay? Like you sit in ice, okay, that actually uh, causes you to stimulate things like, like brown fat, yeah, okay? And I actually find a lot of people have got issues with brown fat because your high brown fat stores are around areas where you've got high metabolic activity, like around areas like your thyroid, yeah, okay, your, your liver, your kidneys and your adrenals. But let's look at what people are suffering, like hypothyroidism, hypocortisolemia, they've got poor liver function, poor kidney function, and that's probably what they've got poor brown fat stores, okay? Now just to understand, when you get in the ice, yeah, okay, you're, you're gonna have to generate heat, okay, which means you're stimulating more brown fat, which is higher mitochondria, which basically means you stimulate a protein called UPC number one, which is uncoupling protein, which means you're taking fats and sugars and you're converting them into what? Heat. Okay, it's like for me, it's completely underrated. Yeah, okay. Listen, you know what we should invent? You know those um, tummy 
trimmers you know people sit there and they're like oh i'm losing weight we should do that but in ice water because then it actually might, might actually work you know like I'm it's gonna do it, something we can, go, we can go into business people here, like mate. you know i just want i just want to <laughs> sit back and lose fat and not do anything i just want to lose my sleep yeah just either way like you sit in cold water and I yeah. just want to see someone who would buy something like that. And a person who would buy the tummy trimmer, <laughs> sit in some cold water and just be like, yeah, I'm losing I fat. That'd be like, it, it, yeah, it, it just. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, ice therapy is a hard sell. Yeah. Okay. And, but I don't, I don't think great. there's anything more indicative or a reflection of life itself. Okay. Because most of the time, the best things in life, there's a bit of short-term pain for a long-term gain. Okay. You get in the ice, there's a short-term pain there. But then that long-term gain of reducing the inflammatory load, helping with things like um, like fat burning, helping with those things like uncoupling protein, helping with things like PGC number one, which helps with mitochondrial density, okay? Like there's this huge array of biochemical benefits, yeah, okay? But you have to go through a little bit of this short-term. You guys do it once a month down at 5EW? At I, I went month? through a stage, I think it was a little bit of ego, yeah, okay? I just wanted to see if I could get up to Wim Hof standard, yeah, okay? Because um, he's obviously <laughs> done like one hour, 56 minutes, uh, like actually in ice. Uh, me and uh, one of my clients, Mark, we actually got up to 30 minutes at one degree, yeah? I was pretty keen to keep on going, but Mark just couldn't, like there's a bit of an after drop, okay? Like when the blood's actually going back into your extremities and that, it's actually quite painful, yeah? Um, but actually- what, what do you mean, hang on, back up. What do you mean it goes back into your extremities? So, has... so basically because you've obviously, you, you gotta protect your core temperature, yeah. okay? So when you actually start moving again and so forth, the blood's rushing back into the extremities and actually that, that feeling of flushing can actually be quite painful in the in the in the lower extremities like your fingers more more your hands to be honest yeah okay and actually most of the time you're sitting in the ice and you're just thinking i wouldn't mind just staying in here so i don't have to feel that yeah okay yeah. actually once you get past the first minute and a half two minutes in the ice yeah, okay it's easy yeah, okay because at the end of the day it's just like it's just like training yeah okay the body's going to do what it's going to adapt Okay, and it's just the fact that people, it's a good stress on the body. It's asking your body to adapt, yeah, okay? And that's why in the middle of winter, like people need to understand, Melbourne's not cold. Like I never wear a jumper, yeah, okay? Because actually got good blood flow, good circulation, good uh, thermostat, yeah, okay? Like I'm actually able to regulate my body temperature and people just go, well, you're shivering, that's bad. I'd argue that to the cows come home. When you're shivering, that is your body generating heat. Let your body generate heat. Let your body do what it's good at. Most of the time we're taking it away from, from doing what it's good at, yeah, okay? And then guess what? Like, you're not gonna be great at taking sugars and fats and then converting that into, into heat and energy. Sensational, yeah. Yeah. sensational. All right, now we'll actually turn to the audience for questions. So our first audience question is from Beck. Hi. Um, Hi, Beck. I just wanted to get your gist of a gen prop client walk, walks into your studio and just run through it. I know it's going to be a very general topic, but mm. your process of nutrition, stress, um, training, what is your basic protocol? Yeah. Um, straight up. Look, basic protocol, because I, th I think for me, I just don't deal with general pop so much anymore. Yeah, okay. Because basically the people come to me, they've got serious ailments and diseases and they're actually at a position where they're probably don't have too much choice. Does that make sense? So normally I'm looking at their bloods and I'm go, yeah, going straight into something like epithelium, like repair and uh, intestinal permeability repair and all those types of things. But the guy would generally say, based on what I've been talking about today, is I would start to apply things that are actually gonna help with the structure of that gut lining and so forth, yeah, okay? So uh, giving them something like zinc, yeah, okay? Because for the epithelium, you've got like an ingredient. Okay, and the ingredient for that epithelium is zinc. Actually, vitamin B6, which is pyridoxine. That's why something zinc L-carnosine is generally better because it's bound to a uh, antioxidant. Yeah, okay, or like an amino acid. Okay, so it allows the zinc to stick around longer in the in the gut. Yeah, okay. So zinc L-carnosine, yes, at the moment because people got so many gastrointestinal issues. I, I don't think it's the best zinc. Yeah, okay, but when you've got gastrointestinal issues, it helps with peptic ulcers and H. pylori and SIBO tends to be uptaking better in the gut. B6 as well, but I'm not necessarily saying you have to get that out of taking something like a P5P, okay? Uh, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, because maybe you include a little bit more B6 in your diet, and guess what? Like things like scallops and potatoes are actually really high in B6, yeah, okay? Um, and uh, prebiotics, but the problem with prebiotics, yeah, okay, is generally they can actually feed the, the, the bad bacteria. They, they feed the negative gram bacteria and so forth, yeah, okay? 
but also particular amino acids like things like arginine and, and glutamine. And guess what's quite high in things like arginine and glutamine? Well, I prefer to go things like slow cooked meats in that instance, yeah, okay? I actually prefer to go a little bit more initially with fatty meats, okay? Because they actually help with things like glycine, arginine, yeah, um, and, and proline, yeah, okay? Which means they're also helping with things like synovial fluid and hyaluronic acid. So they're helping with how people move and so forth. So slow cooked meats is a generally an easy win, yeah, okay? Um, so I'm looking at some things that will help with the epithelium, but also things that will help to not damage the epithelium, yeah, okay? So I apply things like meditation, yeah, okay? Now, I'm not gonna get into the complexities like metacognition and all that, but just get them to meditate every single morning, yeah, okay? Doing something like heart math at night, because most of the time people are looking at things like adaptogens and all this type of stuff, just control people's emotional stress at night. Get them to go to bed, that's where they should close their eyes down, put their hand on their heart, okay? It's actually called heart math, yeah, okay? Left hand over the top of the right hand, close their eyes down and think of what they're grateful for. Yeah, okay, gratitude, care, compassion, appreciation. And guess what? Now you've changed their emotional state. These are big wins because that's also gonna affect their heart rate variability, which is a time fragment between beat to beat, yeah, okay? It's one of the quickest ways to impact heart rate variability. Things like oxidation, long-term system and like a steady state, and that's slow. Yeah, okay, it's changing their emotional state because now they're gonna have better sleep. They're gonna have better circadian rhythms, which means they're gonna to help to repair their gut lining and all this type of stuff, yeah, okay? I know for a lot of people that stuff seems fluffy, but I'm just, I'm just telling you, like, and getting them to probably have a cold shower, yeah, okay? Cold shower is an easier win than chucking them in an ice bath, yeah, okay? But for me, like, I wanna go for things that have a huge cascade effect in the body. And even when it comes to micronutrients, we've got too complex, okay? Can't be vitamin C, but don't get like an ascorbic vitamin C, get like a natural vitamin C, like a kakadu plum, yeah, okay? Because the body recognizes it better. Vitamin A is a no brainer, yeah, okay? Because that's, a, that's a, what you need for your stem cells. It helps you with your white blood cells, yeah, okay? Like, like I don't know why like, we've gone for these specialized supplements and so forth. Like I want things that are cascade effect in the body. They're gonna have the biggest chemical reactions, yeah, okay? More cascade effect I get in the body, guess what? More biochemical, um, um, changes in the body, more rebalancing of the body. Thanks for the question, Beck. Yeah. Um, I guess my question was about uh, dieting chemical stresses versus emotional stresses. And so do you find that you're having to um, calm people down when they're focusing so much about the minutia of their diet and little things because they're getting so worked up that they're not hitting their macro or micronutrients for the day? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Like, cause the, believe it or not, when it comes to things like macro plans and you know sticking to a particular like uh, food plan and so forth you know i'm going to be honest i am a big advocate of that okay i'm not talking so much about body composition here yeah i'm talking about i actually use it as a healing mechanism in the body yeah okay because most of the time these people are completely malnourished yeah okay um they're missing a key a, a lot of the key macronutrients and micronutrients and, and me just telling them to eat these certain foods might not still be enough, yeah, okay? It might not be enough to actually help with things like their sex hormones and their thyroid and all that sort of stuff. So I think those types of things, like it's, it's the way you communicate that with people. Does that make sense? Because uh, a lot of the time, yeah, okay, if you, if you explain to them that it's, it's having these healing mechanisms in the body, it's not gonna stress them out so much because they realize it's gonna help with their cognition, it's gonna help with their brain function. More for me is the de like how we're delivering this this information to them but if you deliver in a way that they understand that it's going to benefit their everyday life and it's going to benefit the things that are really high like values for them okay i'm telling you give people good reasons to do things and it does not stress them out give them a poor reason to do something and they're going to be stressed out 100 percent. yeah okay it's the, it's the delivery that is the most important thing in that in in, in that perception. take it yeah perception okay like um, and uh, as I said, people say, say to me, why do you go so technical? Yeah, why, do you, why do you talk about so many technical elements? Because if I turn around and tell someone they need to eat more fats because fats are really good for your cells, what does that mean to them? Like if I give them a list of all the different reactions, you know, that it's gonna help with their steroidal hormones, yeah, okay, that their brain 
basically is made up of saturated fat yeah okay that saturated fats are needed for your white blood cells because especially things like myristic acid and luric acid they help your white blood cells recognize pathogens and microorganisms all of a sudden they might not remember any of that yeah true but now it's they've got huge significance on that does that make sense now they've got huge significance which means when people have got huge association with how important it is what do they do they do it Awesome. Thanks for the question. Liam, sir. Um, yeah, thanks, David. I liked your quote at the start about the information matters, um, if you don't research more than me in the room. Um, but my question today was um, sugar and artificial sweeteners and obviously affecting leaky gut and uh, then therefore leading to a potential body fat gain. Um, can you give me a breakdown of how artificial sweeteners actually lead to gut damage and excess body fat gaining, if it does? Which, uh, which artificial sweeteners are you talking about? In, well, those in, more in the high FODMAP area, um, like the ones that are found in juices. Um, like stevia, aspartamine. Yeah. What yeah. others? Um, sorbitol, uh, even honey, for example. Yeah, I mean, like you, you're looking at a lot of the, the, the sort of good sweeteners that are obviously coming to the fore, which are more based on the on the low FODMAP realms, like things like maple syrup, yeah, okay? And the good thing about something like maple syrup is so high in trace minerals and so forth. Like when I look at sweetness, yeah, okay? This is what people should be doing. You should be looking at it and say, what does it give my body? Okay, now look, if I look at stevia, so don't get me wrong, I'm not disputing the science on stevia, okay? And yes, it doesn't have the same negative impact on your blood glucose levels, yeah, okay? But then they, there's a, the science isn't conclusive, but we can say that stevia potentially might cause a little bit of disruption with some microbiome imbalances and so forth, yeah, okay? But it's, it's not necessarily conclusive, yeah, okay? But I do tend to find when I give people, if people have things like stevia and they've got things like negative gram bacteria and SIBO, it tends to aggravate their gut, yeah, okay? But I really encourage people when it comes to sweeteners is, 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 is identify what am I getting out of these sweeteners, yeah, okay? Um, and honey for me is a good natural sweetener because it actually helps with beneficial enzymes. It's got antibacterial benefits and so forth. But then the fructose can be a problem for when people do have actual bacterial issues. And once again, but that's not the problem of honey. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Sometimes it's the quality of honey that can be an issue because it's got high fructose corn syrup and so forth because it's been sort of crossbred and so forth. Yeah, okay. But I'd say it's more of the, the issue with your gut lining. Does that make sense? Okay. And so once again, if you fix the gut lining and you get rid of the bacterial issues and so forth, then you're not going to face this thing where you've got to avoid all these good sweeteners and so forth. Yeah, okay. You've got things like... Uh, uh, rice malt syrup, yeah, okay, because rice malt syrup is a good sweetener to use because it's low fructose. But once again, that's whilst you've got issues with fructose and so forth, it's a it's a good alternative, yeah, okay. And things like molasses, yeah, okay, because molasses is really high in things like iron and so forth. So I think there's better alternatives while you've got gastrointestinal issues. But I always look at sweeteners and say, what am I getting from it, okay? And if you're getting trace minerals and you're getting things like B vitamins, you're getting things like these are the sweeteners we should be, that's, that's how we need to look at food. Yeah, okay, like we need to look at what am I getting from it? How does it might benefit my body? And what I'd argue is things like, you know, like stevia and xylitol, what am I getting? What am I getting that my, what that's actually gonna benefit my body and so forth. And if I'm gonna get all these other amazing properties from things like, you know, uh, maple syrup and so forth, that's a no brainer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Agreed, yeah. Very, very good way to put that. Yeah, yeah very good. Very good. Are you are you adverse to the artificial sweeteners? Once again, I just I just educate the people with like what are we getting from it? That that's what that's what I think people need to to look at food. Like it's like because rather does, than be the three year old of that tastes sweet and I'm just yeah, substituting like, and food's supposed to be sweet. If there is say uh, bacteria in your in your gut lining uh, and you are having carbs, which uh, end up being sugar anyway, yeah. So they're feeding bacteria um which would be more problematic for things like yeast and candida and 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 particular parasites like blasto like blastocytis hominis and dentamoeba fragilis and that because they do feed on carbohydrates but understand a lot of negative gram bacteria is fine on carbs okay and it just tends to be like the fos's like the fruit to oligosaccharides like things like onion and garlic and leeks and artichokes and wheat and barley and 
It, does that does it make sense? Yeah, it's almost where you come back to. There's no real wrong foods. It's all about what's happening in here. So it's doing all, it's glucose or high. Uh, yeah, just corn and, syrup still going to affect. And yeah, exactly. Like I just like I just got to get away from the de- like you know people saying that 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 meat is bad. Poor quality meat is bad. Meat's exceptionally good for you. And I'd argue a lot of people have got been turned off by uh, animal protein and that. I'd argue they've actually got things like H. pylori and hydrochloric acid issues because guess what? If you've got hydrochloric acid issues, you don't eat meat. Okay. You're going to be yeah. off put by yeah. the thought of eating meat, okay? Because you can't and so, it. Yeah. and so the body's sort of intuitive in that way. It just goes, this is quite a taxing process in the body, yeah, okay? And I'd argue that number one probably reason they've got hydrochloric acid issues in the in the in the stomach is because they've got poor energy systems, mm. yeah, okay? Mean. And they've got like poor ATP production. And the, if they've got poor ATP, then they've got poor byproducts like things like uh, like um, carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide. Uh, mixes with water in the body to form bicarbonate okay and bicarbonate is one of the key building blocks that I need for hydrochloric acid okay so you could say that they've got the poor energy system yeah okay then they're then they're they're producing low levels of hydrochloric acid because they're not getting enough things like carbon dioxide and so forth and then that's going to affect how they're breaking down things like animal protein they go oh the animal protein makes me feel sick and so forth and I go yeah but that's it's an issue in your digestive system and you've actually taken out a food group based on the fact that it's hard to break down and so forth and it's the same thing with like fats because if I've got problems with the 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 epithelium and so forth that affects things like mycelizing factors which actually help with fats and oils and so forth yeah okay and then they just go well it feels hard in my gut and so then they're going to eat more carbohydrates okay Mm. but it's not a problem with the fats it's the same thing when people have got things like their bilirubin might be really really elevated which can be a sign of fat metabolization issues you have fat malabsorption and then we look at that and that's the problem when you look at things and you're just basing it on what's going on in that moment in time okay and then they go you should eat more carbohydrates and you shouldn't eat as many fats and i would argue actually the reason they've probably got the elevated bilirubin is because they they've got a build up of bilirubin in the bloodstream because the bilirubin is not actually getting processed in the small intestine properly because they've got something like SIBO, like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And what's the worst thing you could potentially give the person in that instance? More carbohydrates. Yeah, you actually cause a bigger problem. Do you know what I mean? So, so this they, demonization of food needs to stop. We stop demonizing dairy, stop demonizing, you know, fruit, stop demonizing whatever, because most of the time it's the quality and it's the problem, the area that has to assimilate it, which is your digestive system. One thing, I, uh, one thing that I didn't bring up, which I think is a great analogy, if I had a waterfall and I said to you, Mark, yeah, okay. TLC, yeah. <laughs> waterfalls, don't go chasing them waterfalls. <laughs> if I had a waterfall and I said to you, Mark, why isn't this waterfall flowing properly? What part of the waterfall would you go to to find out why it's not flowing properly? Well, obviously the bottom, no, <laughs> uh, obviously the top. It's the top. Right, and yeah. what I say, the top of the waterfall is food. It's the quality of the food that you're putting in your body. The middle section is the area that has to assimilate it. That has to, it's like the filing cabinet. It has to help us produce these particular uh, um, compounds, like protein compounds and neurotransmitters and, and hormones and so forth. And the bottom is the byproducts. It's the neurotransmitters, it's the hormones and so forth. And guess which area of the waterfall we've been stuffing around? The bottom of the waterfall, we've been stuffing around the byproducts. And I'm not saying they're not issues. Because with a lot of people, they're going to have genetic mutations, 100%. I'm not de- denying that. But if I want to have the biggest cascade, cascade effect in the body, I'm going to look at the quality so, of that food and I'm going to look at the area that is the filing cabinet and it has to sort it. So, Dave, this has been epic. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks Thank for you. Having me. It's, yeah, been it's been a been, real, been real an pleasure. We've got to do this again sometime. For sure. Uh, where can people learn more about you? Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not big on Instagram. I am going to get on there eventually. Yeah, okay. But... Um, Look, uh, Fifth Element Wellness, which is uh, 5ew.com.au. Yeah, okay. Um, look, I do take a lot of seminars. I take seminars on like gut health. That's probably the realms that I'm going to go more and more into. It's the seminar called It's All About the Gut. I go even a little bit further down this rabbit hole. Yeah, okay. But a lot of the remedies that I'm bringing into how to fix these issues, yeah, I think, and a lot of things that I've talked about is complex today, but the things we, we can do to fix it, they're not complex. Yeah, I, they're I'm actually- pretty psyched. I want to bring you and Ben Kantz in, Wolf, in the Wolfpack, put you in the same same room together and just shoot the shit. Well, I think it'd be, it'd be yeah. dynamite. So we'll, we're <laughs> going to get that one teed up, I think, August if we can. Um, I'll speak to, to Ben and you and I've see if we can do that. Biggest respect for, for Ben in the industry. Yeah, he's doing he's, amazing he's, things. He is. Yeah. 
So uh, thank you, Dave, for the Thanks, interview. Dave. This is this has been the Wolf's Den with David O'Brien. This is episode 12. 12? 11? 12? I'm not even sure we're up to anymore. But thank you for watching. As always, remember to subscribe on YouTube. Listen to us on iTunes. And if you could, leave us a review. It means a lot to us and much more than you can know. So till next time, folks, supplement smart, eat well, and train hard. See you guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Wolf's Den with David O'Brien. Hey folks, are you in Melbourne? If you're in Melbourne, we would love to have you at Enterprise Fitness in the shooting of the next Wolf's Den episode. So it's 381 Swan Street in Richmond. That's the, my home, Enterprise Fitness. And we shoot these episodes live in front of a studio audience. So we take a $10 donation at the door. The donation goes to the Royal Children's Hospital. So we donate all the proceeds to the Royal Children's Hospital and uh, you're welcome to come along to the next one. So. When to know episodes that are coming up, the best place to know is to head over to my Instagram account, hit follow, and you get all the updates of new episodes and guests that I'm gonna have in the studio. So till next episode, train hard, supplement smart, and eat well.